So my name is Susan Vanek and my co-author is Jana Rigel. And today we're going to discuss the use of photography as a tool to both document and explore shared communication across species and the environment, and to highlight it, it's some of its utilities as well as some of its limitations. Over the last 20 years, there's been increasing efforts to push anthropology beyond the primary focus on humans and human to human relations and to incorporate, for instance, a greater appreciation of the material, of living and non-living beings, and of other ways of knowing and experiencing the world that can't be captured in speech or writing alone. This is not to say that animals and plants or sights and sounds, for instance, have been completely absent from ethnography in the past, but their presence has but largely been muted, edited out and submerged under assumed human exceptionalism and the privileged place of words. But if we want to get anthropology to go deeper to this thicker ethnography and to bring other beings as well as being into our work, we need to both incorporate new approaches and methods, as well as to reevaluate our existing toolkit. In our discussion today, we're going to explore the use of photography and its potential to draw attention to experiences and interactions and relations that often go unremarked in interviews. And we're going to draw on examples from a five-year research project in Greenland funded by the U.S. National Found Science Foundation that was completed in 2020. Now, the use of photography has a long history in anthropology. An entire subfield of visual anthropology has grown up around its use, as well as the use of other visual technologies. This tends to focus on the production of ethnographic material, as well as the use of the visual as a tool for exploring human perception and imagination. This work has raised a number of important issues relating to representation, authority, and power, but has also opened up new avenues for participation in research, participation in which creativity and experience takes on a greater role and which the researcher's place, at least partially, is restricted. We employed some of these methods in the design of our project in Greenland. So to give you a little bit of background, the Rockwell Kent and early 1930s Greenland project combined visual, historical, and anthropological methodologies to approach how social, cultural, and environmental changes and continuities are constructed and experienced in Greenland. We worked in four communities, that of Ithorsuit, Omanak, Sisimut, and Nook, with populations that ranged from under 80 residents to 17,000 residents, representing both urban and rural areas of the country. Photography was used in two ways in this project. First, photographs taken by Rockwell Kent, who was an American artist and photographer that lived in Greenland in the 1930s, were used as a springboard for conversations with adults and elders about change and continuities. It should be remembered that when using photographs in this way, that such historic pictures are not unbiased glimpses into the past, but are instead situated products taken by a particular individual, in this case, an outsider to Greenland and an outsider to the Arctic, an American during the interwar years. So much like travel logs or other such writings, these photographs and all photographs often tell us much more about the photographer and their culture and society and individual views than the places or people they're trying to capture. So the second way we used photographs and to sort of counter Kent's photographs was through workshops with students in each of the study communities. As a contemporary counter to Kent's photographs and as a way to begin to incorporate perspectives from youth that live in Greenland today, a counterweight to the photograph of an outsider or a foreigner. However, before we, you begin working with children and youth, a number of ethical issues must be considered. First, there's issues of consent and unequal power relations. And also that even though we aren't present when these photos are being taken, that we're still there. We're there through our questions, through our presence in the communities, as outsiders, as adults, and as researchers. So the way we put this together, we contacted local schools in advance via email, and then we met with school leaders, teachers, parents, and community members before the start of the research to get feedback that can be incorporated into the project design and to see if there was any interest in a project like this. 
Since there was interest, uh, we continued communication with teachers and schools. We sent them overviews of plans for the workshops in advance to get their feedback and to get feedback from students and to set a date for our return and to begin research. Workshops were conducted over a one to two week period, taking place during the school day for approximately one hour, two to three times a week, depending on availability. Teachers were asked to include a brief history of, asked us to include a brief history of different photographic styles and a general overview of photographic techniques that we can incorporate into the workshop so the kids could learn from it as well. The students um, were provided digital cameras for the duration of the workshops and were also asked to keep a photo diary where they re could record information of, about their pictures. So why they were taking them, what inspired them, any other information they wanted to record. These diaries went mainly unused. During the photo workshops, we had our initial meeting and then during subsequent meetings, one team member would collect, uh, collect the cameras, download the photos during each session and return them to the students. All cameras and diaries were collected at the end of the workshops and then later on the cameras were donated to the schools. After all the photos were taken and we were able to re review them and, and print some of them, exhibitions were held with um, of the students' work in each of the towns. And it gave us an opportunity to discuss the photos, not only with the students, but with adults and other community members. Also, some of the students used these two uh, events to raise money for class field trips. So it had a dual use. We then, um, left, we reviewed all the photographs, we translated uh, all the adult interviews, uh, we began our analysis. Any photo diaries, we translated those as well, but again, those were very limited. And later we returned to each of the towns. Uh, we met again with students, we discussed their photos further, we asked them to write captions. Uh, the caption process, much like the diaries, didn't really work. But to be honest, with all the wealth of the photographs, you're not really missing anything with these diaries. So that being said, uh, the photographs produced by the students gave us glimpses into interactions with the living world and other than human encounters, hints at smells and sounds that we never would have gained access to if they had written it down or if we had interviewed them. So for instance, there's interactions with animals, plants, and the environment, sort of everyday life as a contact zone. So non-humans in the home, fish, guinea pigs, dogs, all of these appeared over and over again in student photographs. And then even more than that were dogs, the ubiquity of sled dogs in uh, communities that have them. And one community in our study did not, the city of Nook, all the other ones did have sled dogs. Sled dogs were a constant feature in these pictures. And with the students interacting with them in number numerous ways. There were photos of hunting, fishing, and preparation from, thing, from animals caught in the wild to industrial fishing and fish packing. All of these things that have parts in their everyday lives. There are plants, numerous pictures of plants both in winter when you would think they would be gone through fall to spring and summer, constant features. And then there's interactions with the living world in everyday life from things that would be considered extraordinary to outsiders like pictures of mountains or, uh, or icebergs to everyday life, a road in the winter, a laundry being hung on a line to dry. Then there's hints at multi-sensory experiences, the cold of winter, the feel of wind, the smell of smoke, the sound of a boat mo motor and splashing water. The pictures hint at all of these different things that we never would have noticed if we had just asked them to tell us about what their life was like. Then to experience of eating, food, cooking, smells of different delicacies, as well as the act of sharing and participating in these things together. And then we have play, just kids sort of acting like kids and both 
displaying and staging, as well as just capturing uh, a flip or a fun time as it's happening. And then we have creativity and imagination. Using these different photographs for expression, manipulating the photographs themselves, and through that, their way of interacting with the world. These photographs gave us a wealth of information and avenues that we could build on and follow to try to get to sort of a deeper experience of living in these communities as being part of an interactive community that goes beyond that of humans and is more than just speech. But it also should be noted that there are limitations to photography. So first off, humans are still centered in these relations. Humans are the ones taking the pictures. They're the ones coming up with the technology. They're producing images for other humans or even just for themselves. Then also we as researchers are still present and continue to influence this process through our presence being there, also through our questions, and then later on through our choice of photographs to display and the way they're organized, these are still unequal levels of power. And then what we're seeing is only glimpses. They're static snapshots of moments that are divorced from other sensory input. But that being said, they still give us a glimpse into mundane instances of interactions that are more than human, that are between animals and plants and people and the environment around them, that sort of found, form the foundations of everyday life. They're quick flashes into these interactions and experiences, but they offer an avenue for further research. And that's why we really feel photography can, can do more than just take pictures. It can give us insight, it can give us directions. It can lead us to looking at things we might not have ignored before or just might not have even seen. So that's where we are. And we think we can really build on this sort of research. And that's what we want to bring to you today. So thank you very much for our audience. I also want to thank the communities of Ithorswit, Womanox, Sissimut, and Nook, to the local schools, teachers, administrators, and all the students and their family, to the US National Science Foundation for their support of this project. Uh, Alyssa Matu Suffolk, which is the University of Greenland and Rochester Institute of Technology, as well as Binghamton University, which is part of the State University of New York. Uh, special thanks also to Polar Field Services for finding us housing and transportation and for Nikon for the donation of cameras. And for, the mo for more than anything else to the students who took all these incredible shots. We had more than 10,000 photographs in total. Um, which is wonderful, a lot of work, but really wonderful. And thank you all again for, for being able to uh, include me in the conference, even though I couldn't be here. If you have any questions or would like a full list of references in which this presentation is bu built on, please just email me. So thank you very much and have a good rest of the conference. <laughs>